Okay. Okay, thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce one of my favorite journalists uh, who's joined us here just for this event today in New York. Uh, Gita Fakhri is the host of the uh, Doha debates, uh, as well as an anchor on TRT World, and she's uh, traveled uh, in the Middle East, in Europe, and here in New York in just the past week. So it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you very much indeed, Jennifer. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Tawakkul Karman Foundation as well for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with President Monsef Marzuki, who's our keynote speaker. Uh, this conference, of course, has been focusing on all the incredible challenges that Yemen still faces today, but also on the potential solutions on the way to economic and political recovery, stability, of course, first and foremost, and social mobilization. So in a way, it's very interesting as well to draw on the experience that other countries have had on their way to recovery as they have uh, figured out a way out of the instability that their countries have faced. Uh, with me here is Monsef Marzuki, who served as the first president of Tunisia after the 14 January revolution. He is a doctor of medicine, a human rights activist, the founder of the center-left Congress Party for the Republic. He's also an author who has published numerous works, both in Arabic and in French, on Arab democracy and the rule of law in the Arab and Islamist world and Arab and Muslim societies. President Marzuki will deliver his opening remarks, after which I will have a few questions for him. And if you have questions as well, we will gladly open the floor to questions. President Marzuki, the floor is yours. Well, um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, very warmly uh, my sister Tawakir Kermel uh, and uh, the university for this invitation. Uh, I'm very proud uh, to be here, but I wouldn't say that I am very happy uh, to talk about such an issue. I would have liked to, to talk about uh, the construction of the, the success of the Arab Spring or something like this. But unfortunately, we have to tackle all of this the situation, this kind of problem. Uh, I wonder what can I uh, add uh, that could be interested, interesting uh, for you after what we uh, have uh, heard this morning. I am not a Yemeni, of course. I am not uh, involved in the political struggle. I don't know everything about this Yemeni situation. I, I think I, I can uh, add something interesting just by uh, uh, you know, giving you the, uh, the whole picture, because I, I do believe that you cannot understand exactly what's happening in Yemen if you don't put this crisis uh, in, the, in the, the broad perspective of the crisis in the, of the Arab world. Um, I'm afraid to say that, in fact, uh, the tragedy of Yemen is a little piece of the tragedy going on on the whole Arab world. So if you want to understand this small crisis, you have to understand the huge crisis going on on the Arab world. Um, you probably know that I have been in charge uh, as president uh, in a very difficult and very uh, very difficult and very painful part of the Tunisian history. But I was also with Tawak Kermal, part of the, 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 the whole movement of the, the Arab Spring. Uh, I remember in 2011, uh, before I became president, uh, when we have had this, uh, the first outburst in Tunisia, uh, I was so happy to see that Yemen is joining the club, because the club of the, you know, the countries, uh, of the Arab country were at, the, at the moment were Tunisia, then Egypt, then Libya, then uh, and Syria. And uh, Yemen joined the club in February 17, if I, if I remember well. 
I was so proud at that moment, and I must said, uh, confess that I was also a little bit upset because I thought, my goodness, what would happen? Because at the moment, we in Tunisia, we want our movement to be as peaceful as possible. We want this revolution to be a democratic and peaceful revolution. So I said to myself, look, here in Tunisia, probably we can manage, even in Egypt, but what would happen in, 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 this, in a country like uh, Yemen? Uh, because the idea we, we have in Tunisia about Yemen is that a country of warriors, you know, fierce warriors, uh, a country where you have a lot of mountains, uh, where you can have an endless uh, guerrilla war. And I thought to myself, maybe they would probably, they could revert to a, a kind of, uh, um, you know, violent revolution. And I was so relieved, we were so relieved and so proud and so happy to see, no, no, they, even if this country is uh, supposedly to be a violent country, etc. In fact, they had the most peaceful revolution within the peaceful revolution of the, the Arab Spring. And this was extremely, uh, extremely uh, for us, uh, uh, we were so proud and uh, so sure that probably we would uh, succeed everywhere because if in Yemen people are able to tackle uh, peacefully uh, the deep crisis we have in the whole Arab world, then we can expect everything. And then I was relieved also to see the political process going on, you know, uh, the discussion, the, the, the national dialogue, uh, the writing of constitution, etc. Everything was okay. So. Uh, and I began, at, the, at that moment I was uh, head of state and I began to, to dream about a new uh, Arab Union with, uh, you know, with uh, democratic, democratic states, free people, and so forth. And then, uh, the beginning of the nightmare with the coup. And then the civil war, etc., etc., etc. And then at that moment I realized that in fact, what's happening in Yemen is normal because it was now up to the Yemeni to pay the high price of the Arab Spring. Because all the members of the clubs, they had to pay the high price of the, this uh, revolution. You know, you remember that uh, how the things uh, went on in, in Libya, the civil war in Libya very soon, then the civil war in, in Syria, then the coup in Egypt, than the civil, than the war, of course, in uh, in Yemen, and even in Tunisia. In Tunisia is always supposed to be the, uh, you know, Tunisia is the good example, etc. You have how this kind of myth that uh, Tunisia is a uh, uh, success story of the the Arab Spring, but in fact it is not. It's not that. Of course, when you compare the situation of Tunisia to the situation currently of Yemen or Syria, it looks like a success story, but in fact. The, the Arab Spring failed also in Tunisia because we have the comeback of the of the, the old regime. What happened? What happened? You have to here once again. You have to put the the, the tragedy of Yemen within the whole the, the perspective, the the, the the wide range of uh, what happened in the, in the Arab world. In fact, what happened the, the, is part of the struggle between two political forces within the Arab world, I would talk about a civil, Arab civil war going on for more than one century. Sometimes with huge crisis like we have had in, the, uh, in the 2011, sometimes you know, with just, just a, I would say, a normal amount of repression. But in fact, we, we in the Arab world, we have this kind of civil war for more than one century between two parties, you have corrupt elites that use the state as a tool for preserving their own interests. And then the new generation, mainly the, what I call the E-generation, the, the new generation, fighting for more democratic states, for the rule of law, for uh, uh, real uh, uh, use of the wealth, etc., etc. And then what happened in the, during the Arab Spring that you have had this success of people going, taking to the street and uh, you know, getting rid of their dictators and sending very powerful message to the other dictators, they, hey, now it's, it's our time now. And I think this, this message was received, was well received by the other dictatorships and those dictatorships that decided that game must 
finished that we must get rid of this. We must tackle this, uh, 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 those revolution everywhere. And also, they, we have to give a good lesson to the peoples so they don't begin again to bother us. And this is what happened exactly. When you talk about the intervention of the Saudi regime and the United Arab regime, you talk mainly about the intervention of the old political system. The old political system, feeling that it is threatened by this Arab Spring, and feeling that if something is not done, they would be, it would be that, uh, the, 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 they would be the, the, the next victim of this uh, uprising uh, coming from within the society. So I think in, in 2011, the decision has been taken that we must destroy the Arab Spring. And I can say that they succeeded because the Arab Spring has been destroyed by civil war in Libya, by civil war in, uh, in Syria, by civil war in Yemen, by the coup in Egypt, and by, uh, uh, you know, by, uh, by uh, using in Tunisia uh, the media, corrupt media, corrupt political parties, etc., to help the old regime to come back democratically. It's, it's an irony in Tunisia that, in fact, the people who fought against democracy, you know, they could come back using the democratic system, the democratic election to come back once again and to, uh, to, to try now, they're trying to do, they're trying to do everything they can do you now to get rid of the, even the souvenir of the, of the revolution. So <clears throat> this is my point of view. Uh, you cannot understand the, the, the tragedy of, uh, of Yemen if you don't put it in the, this perspective. It's a, a struggle between a new political order and the, or, the ancient political order. The second level to understand what's happening is that f because now the Arab world is divided because it's, uh, the Arab states are extremely weak, now we are battlefield for proxy wars. This is the second level to, ex to explain the situation. For the moment, uh, Yemen is a battlefield. Uh, Syria is a battlefield. Uh, Libya is a battlefield. I can say that even Lebanon is a battlefield, you know, for proxy wars between the new uh, superpower, regional superpower, I Iran and uh, mainly Saudi Arabia. So if you don't understand also this level of the problem, you can, you, you can miss something very important. So the Yemeni are not suffering only because they have to pay the high price uh, because they revolted against dictatorship, but also because they are now battlefield of this game power between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. And the third level, the third level, of course, is um, the, the, the intervention or the non-intervention of the West. I, I, I must say that uh, when I was uh, in charge, I was extremely surprised by the attitude of the West and especially the United States, because I thought we are going to get a lot of support because we are Democrats, we are human rights activists, we are close to the West, etc., etc. In fact, we didn't have this, this support. We were said, yes, you are good guys. It's, it's good what you have done. But uh, look, uh, we don't like uh, that uh, democratization means Islamization. And you should say, no, it doesn't mean anything. It means democratization. It's been the rule of law. It means freedom of association. It doesn't mean Islamization. Even if the Islamists are part of the game, what's the problem? No, no, no. We, we don't believe that democratization can, can go with uh, the Islamization. And, and uh, remember what happened when uh, uh, against uh, Mohammed Morsi, the coup, uh, you know, after the coup uh, in 2013 in Egypt, I was quite sure that I will be the next. And this is exactly what happened because I saw the whole, the whole plot. So this whole plot against the democratization and against the Arab Spring, you, know, you have the first level, the old political system, the old uh, Arab political system, and then, of course, this, uh, the, 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 this uh, proxy war, this uh, war uh, b between the re regional powers and the, the full support of the West. Look, what, look at the way that the West is uh, uh, dealing with Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Abdel Fattah al-Sisi is the worst dictator that we have had in the Arab world, probably worse than uh, Bashar al-Assad. And uh, this guy, you know, uh, 
first of all, his success means that the Arab Spring is over, and this, the message was sent to the Egyptian people that, look, you, you got rid of, uh, of Mubarak, now we are going to have a dictator worse than the, the previous one. So shut up and uh, don't move, because you will have to pay the price, a uh, higher price, if you move again. And Abdel Fassah, he said it very clearly. He said that, look, we are not going to accept any things like what happened in 2011. And l look how this guy is supported by the West, by France, by, uh, by the United States, and so forth. So the message sent by the, by the West to the Democrats like me, forget about it. Forget about it. Democracy is good for us, but not good for you. This is the message. And if you want democracy, you have to take the problem by yourself. Don't expect any real uh, support from the West. This is the message we have, we have received. And I think the message now in Yemen is the, the, the same. I th of course, we, you, we have to do everything. We have to do everything we can, uh, we can do to, the, to put the pressure to raise the awareness in the, the, the Western public, because the Western public is, uh, I think, it has been our uh, ally during the battle against dictatorship and still is uh, our ally. But I doubt, I really doubt that uh, the Western government would uh, really help in, uh, in doing uh, something, accepting, uh, uh, going back to the old situation that, okay, we will have peace, but you have, we will have to accept to, uh, to, to live under our dictator, our dictators. Our dictators are good dictators. Look at the way that they, uh, uh, the United States, they are uh, dealing with the Venezuela problem and the way they are dealing with the Egyptian problem. So both can be considered as dictators, but the way this is a good dictator, this is our dictator, and this is a bad dictator because it's not our good dictator. So I'm, I'm sorry to say that we Arabs, we have got the lesson. Uh, the lesson. We do know that... Uh, we have to rely on ourselves that democracy is no more, no more a Western uh, value. It's international value. We have to adopt it and we have to fight it, to fight for it against our corrupt elite, against uh, uh, regional power, and also against the attitude of the, of the West. This is very sad to say, but it's my, my conclusion. Now, um, uh, I heard this morning uh, Mr. Heike saying that he's very pessimistic about um, the, the outcome of all this uh, story. Mm, I like the word of uh, one of the most important writer, a Palestinian, Emil Habibi, he invented the word mutashail, which means pessi-optimistic. <laughs> and the, so I am also a mutashail. I, I think that uh, we have to accept that the situation is extremely uh, awful, dangerous, etc., and probably it will take a long time to, uh, to solve the problem. But I also uh, optimistic. I see the resilience I admire. And I salute the resilience of the Yemeni people. Uh, I see the resilience of, uh, the, uh, of the Egyptian people, the resilience of the Algerian people, the resilience of the Sudanese people, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, <laughs> I do believe that in the, in the long run, we will win. We will win because we are the expression of the new uh, hope the, of the majority. And we are uh, dealing with corrupt elite that have lost everything. They have, they have lost the battle for hearts and mind. Now they are uh, sticking to their uh, interest only with violence. And even if they are uh, supported by the Western government, I think they are losing ground and they are lo losing the, the battle. So all what I can say that I'm so sad for what's happening in Yemen because uh, uh, I, I'm a human being. I remember this, you know, this uh, uh, photo of this uh, Yemeni girl. It's it's some, something ex unacceptable that in the 20th century, uh, people, uh, children would die by hunger. It's extremely uh, painful, but we have to accept that situation and we have to know that it's probably the price we Arabs have to pay for our freedom. Uh, the price for freedom has been always very costful. We have to pay the price. We will pay it, and at the, the, we will gain, and we will have this freedom that we are longing for. So thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, President Marzuki. Interesting.
uh, disheartening and at the same time refreshing to hear you speak so candidly about what many of us might have thought was a success story, at least in Tunisia. Many of us thought the so-called, and I say so-called Arab Spring because it never really uh, materialized did it in so many places, and you referred to the, the failed experiments in Egypt, the disastrous situation in uh, Syria, the situation in Libya with the foreign intervention and the, the, the state of chaos and civil war that that country finds itself in. Uh, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on what's going on today on the streets of Algeria with young people being fed up, as you say, with the corruption, wanting to weigh in once again and take the situation into their own hands because their president has announced that he wanted to run for a fifth term. So keeping that in mind, I do want to touch first off on the three key issues that you mentioned. You say there's a struggle between two political forces in the Arab world, and that has gone on for centuries. Uh, you mentioned the proxy wars that many Arab countries find themselves the battlefields of with the region with the regional dynamics going on, particularly between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and you mentioned the non-intervention of the West. So let's pick on that point first, perhaps, and then walk our way back to the other two. Um, to be sure, Yemen, as you mentioned, is a proxy war. No one can deny that. Uh, different forces putting it in two different directions with Saudi Arabia and Iran, the main protagonists. But can this war, in your opinion, end as a human rights uh, advocate, can it end without the kind of pressure that the West can impose on, on, uh, on Saudi Arabia, principally the crown prince, to be specific? And how do you explain the quasi-silence that is going on? I mean, there's virtually, any, there's virtu virtually no outcry, it seems, with the numbers of deaths that we have already seen in the country. There is not the outcry that you might expect. What needs to happen? What can happen? Yes, of course. The, the, the war cannot um, end if there is no if there is no pressure from the United States, from uh, Europe, etc., etc. But the problem is that the Saudis have also a lot of uh, uh, possibility to put the pressure, their own pressure on the Western government. I don't know exactly what are the relationship between the current uh, gov US government and the Saudis, but I'm afraid that uh, they both have pressure on each other. So I'm afraid that uh, uh, the, the, the American or the European are not totally free, you know, to, to, to put the pressure on the, on the Saudi to stop the war. But the, the Saudi will stop the war, not because of the pressure of the West, but, but because they are losing the battle, because uh, really, the, because of the resistance of the, 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 the Yemeni people and because the cost, the cost of the war, the, this cost of the war is extremely important for their, their economy. And f I hope that this would be probably the, this would work and this would uh, put the pressure on the Saudis so that, to the end the war. But as long as they keep getting the weapons that they do, principally from the U.S. and the, the U.K., uh, know, can you see them yes. stopping, stopping yes, the war? Yes, I know. I know here, perhaps if the uh, opinion, uh, the, the public in Germany and uh, in, uh, in the United States put the pressure on the government, th this could be a, a way of uh, dealing with the problem. What about the, the second point that you mentioned, that uh, battlefield for proxy wars? Uh, we, we mentioned it uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. How do you see the dynamics playing out? Because of the failure of the Arab states, because uh, uh, because of the failure of Iraq, the failure of Syria as, as a state. And you know, when you have a void, you, this void would be filled by uh, anybody, you know, uh, having the, uh, weapons, money, etc., etc. Because of the failure of Arab states, because of the failure of the Arab national uh, uh, defense uh, policy, etc., you have a lot of failed states. Now, Iraq is a failed state, Syria is a failed state, uh, Libya is a failed state, etc. And then this would, uh, uh, th this would lead to the intervention of, uh, of foreign, uh, of foreign. And this is the so first time in the, in the uh, um, I, I have been a political actor and uh, watching the situation for more than uh, half a century. This is the first time that s something like this uh, is happening. Because even the, even under Saddam Hussein or at other, other time, you know, you have had real uh, uh, real states. But because now we have this failed states, that this make us now a battlefield for uh, for proxy war. And this would probably, be, I'm afraid that many other states 
we would fail for the same reason because they didn't make the reform, the political, the needed political reform, and therefore we will, be, after being a failed state, then you will become a battlefield for uh, for proxy wars. So then, what is your advice to neighboring countries where we see the youth um, moving? wanting a change somehow, because as you say, there is corrupt leadership that just won't, won't go. When you talk about the failed, uh, the failed Arab Spring, what is your advice you have, you have to, to, to these neighboring countries, I think Algeria, long, Sudan, and so on? It's a long process. It's a long process to reconstruct uh, real states, uh, real states meaning uh, uh, states that uh, uh, are accepted by the population, the states that uh, are run by uh, law uh, and values, etc. We Arabs, we have this uh, this challenge. I don't know exactly how long it would take, two decades, three decades, but we have to reconstruct states in Iraq, in Syria, everywhere. And then when we succeed uh, the rec reconciliation between the state and the population, and when we have a real state, then we would tackle the problem of, uh, of the proxy war. Otherwise, we would be, uh, for a long time, the battlefield for, uh, for foreigners, uh, whether they are French, uh, Americans, uh, Iranian, Israelis. Uh, uh, uh. And when we talk about repairing societies, it may be a little premature since there is still a devastating war going on. But let's say we, we get to that stage. I know your experience in Tunisia in December 2013 you launched, uh, as president back then, the Truth and Dignity Commission, mm. which is um, a truth commission of sorts. Has it worked, in your opinion, in giving the people of Tunisia a sense of justice and bring the events to a closure? And, and what do you think needs to happen in the case of Yemen? Because there you've got a different level of, of, of crimes that have been committed. Uh, no, let me answer what the, the, you, you talk about the success story. I'm supposed as former president to say, look, uh, Tunisia is a good success story, etc., etc. But I, ha I have to be honest with you. If we uh, didn't know the fact, the fate of uh, many countries, it's because of the, not because we, we Tunisian were better or uh, smarter or, or uh, etc. It's because of the very structure of Tunisia. Uh, for instance, we uh, we don't have. The army, the Egyptian army, uh, our army is, uh, is a tiny army, is a disciplined army, no business, no business army, etc. So it's extremely different than the, this is why the army sides with the people during the revolution. Uh, unlike Syria, we don't have, uh, we are a very homogeneous society. 99% of Tunisians are Arab, uh, Muslim, Sunni, and this is also very helpful. Um, and like Yemen, we don't have tribes, we don't have, uh, 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 we also, here also we are a uh, very homogeneous society. Uh, f we are a middle class society, we are a westernized society, etc. And we are, uh, the country is a flat country, we don't have a desert, uh, huge de we don't have mountains, we don't have jungles where to hide where we can uh, make a, a guerrilla war. So because of the geography, because of the history, because of the very structure of the society, we are, we are, uh, we, we could d deal with the problem. And also something very important, we are far from the battlefield of the Middle East. So we are not involved in the battlefield of the Middle East. And then also, we are very lucky Arab people because we don't have oil. And this has been very, very important. Mm -hmm. All those reasons, you know, can explain you why we, 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 we manage the transition peacefully. It's not, once again, it's not because we are better than the Yemeni or the Syrian. Uh, Syri, no. It's because of the very structure of the society, etc. But, but what about the tools that were used to enable the society to make that political transition, which was successful, political transition of presidential power. What about that commission? Do you think that something similar could work in the case of Yemen, even though in the case of Yemen, as I say, there are war crimes, serious war crimes, alleged war crimes that were perpetrated by, by foreign, foreign powers. I, I wonder if you think the Yemeni society itself can take care of this issue, um, or it's something that needs to be referred to the UN Security Council. <clears throat> uh, and the ICC. Okay. Yes, um, the Truth Commission, uh, the Truth and Dignity Commission, was set by the. I, I can say by my, by me because when I was president, I really battled for this commission. Nobody wants this commission. Very few people wanted this commission, uh, even uh, within the uh, at the time the political system. And after my departure, this Truth and Commission uh, was extremely, you know. Uh, 
the, the, the regime, currently the regime, they did everything, you know, to stop this, uh, the, this commission from uh, working. The idea, the idea at the time was, look, we have to, to uh, if you want to, to go from the, to move from the dictatorship to a real democracy, we have to, of course, to, uh, to have some change, but we would like this change to be not, not that costful, because don't forget that uh, we, uh, the new regime, many of us, we have been in prison. I have been in prison myself. I have been uh, harassed. I, uh, a lot of my uh, the minister in the government was uh, subjected to torture. And uh, so we suffered a lot from, uh, mm -hmm. we suffered a lot from the, the, the dictatorship. And we said that if we want Tunisia to move uh, peacefully to the, um, to the democratic state, we have to do something about justice, but we have to be very careful because we don't want, you know, to ignite a new civil war. Uh, and this was the idea, and we took this idea from from South Africa. And in, in the 1986, I uh, yes, after the, the uh, I went to South Africa to study the process, to study the problem, because at the time I have had the honor to meet uh, Nelson Mandela, and uh, Nelson Mandela is is my uh, I, I I have always tried to, to be his, uh, you know, to to follow his uh, to follow his path. And I, uh, I knew at the time that this experience would be useful maybe in Tunisia if we uh, can topple the dictatorship. And really, I did my, my best you know, to, uh, to, to promote this idea and to set, that, to set up the structure and uh, to, get, to fund it, etc., etc. But what happened? It's a half success. Once again, it's half success and a half failure. Because... Uh, the, idea, the, the idea is that the, the people, you know, the, who have been um, responsible for torture, etc., either come to the tribunal and say, look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did, I did wrong, uh, I, I ask for pardon, and then you are pardoned, and that's, that's okay. This didn't happen in Tunisia. It happened in South Africa, but in Tunisia it didn't happen. All what we achieved is to write this, the, the real history, and, uh, you know, to try to uh, uh, give... Uh, um, ask the, 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 the victim to talk about what happened to them in public hearing, and this public hearing was aired by the television. It was a very, oh, a very uh, moving moment in, uh, in Tunisian history, but that, that's, that was all. The, the perpetrator refused to now to ask for pardon, and now I can say that this, the transition to justice is uh, half success and half, uh, half failure. Uh, because this guy now would go to the tribunal uh, would go, and they would have to face uh, the normal justice. But the idea is, do you put justice before peace or the other way around? And you, do you focus on referring some crimes to the ICC if you can? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, but I, uh, once again, uh, about Ye Yemen, would it work in, uh, in Yemen? I hope so. I hope, I think you have to, you, you have to try it. You have to try it. But probably you have to prevent them and say, look, uh, don't forget that, for instance, for uh, the crime of torture, uh, by the law, it's not, you, you can be sued at any moment. So don't, uh, so if you don't ask for, for forgiveness, for pardon, then uh, you will have to face the normal justice. You have to prevent them from the beginning, what we didn't. Maybe, maybe at the time, they would come and ask for forgiveness. And if they ask for forgiveness, I think you have to forgive them. But the most important thing is, uh, you know, for the victims, that the victims should be heard and the victims should, should be, uh, you know, uh, uh, treated well and uh, uh, get compensation. And this is very, very important. A tricky balance, no doubt. Um, let's, let's open the floor uh, to questions. We've got one here. Please introduce yourself, and uh, if we can keep it as brief and concise as we can, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, you spoke about uh, revolution, then you spoke about counter-revolutions, but you didn't, uh, and also proxy wars, but the most important thing that I see is who's funding the counter-revolution. In the case of Yemen, uh, we see Al-Amarat plays a huge role, and specifically, Mohammed bin Zayed is leading not only uh, the war against Yemen, both the Houthis and the current government, but uh, creating chaos and uh, creating an atmosphere for genocide. Yes, of course. I, uh, I said that the counter-revolution, you know, the, 
country revolution is led by Saudi and by Emiratis. And Mohammed bin Zayed is probably the, the most important leaders in this uh, counter revolution. And uh, the intervention of the uh, Emirates everywhere, the coup in Egypt, you know, was um, of course the, mainly uh, due to the uh, the support of the Saudi and Emiratis, and even in Tunisia, you know, they put a lot of money. They put a lot of money uh, in the special in the corrupt media, etc. And so they played an important role in the comeback of the of the the, the, the old regime. Uh, but they are uh, behaving on, on behalf of the old political system, not only on behalf of the uh, Emiratis or the Saudi. I think they are. This is why they were supported also by many uh, Arab leaders who were not involved in uh, uh, directly uh, uh, in the counter revolution. They were be uh, once again now in, t uh, in the world you have the, the old political system, and the old political system is based on uh, you know uh, the power of a corrupt elite, uh, repression, uh, control of the press, etc. Classic. The dictatorship. And the other side, you have the new generation that are fed up with this kind of regime, and I think they would topple this regime tomorrow or after tomorrow, but the, 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 I, I'm quite sure that they will, they will win. But the, the, the question is the price, because in fact, when we have had this revolution in Tunisia, because, because of this transient justice, the message we sent to the, the, the dictatorship, it was very simple. Look, we want a, a, a change of regime, but we don't want civil war. We don't want uh, blood, etc., etc. And what was this? Uh, the, the, the response of the dictatorship it said, "Nothing. We are not going to cede uh, anything, and you are going to pay the high price, and you are going to be always our subject, and we are going to use the most uh, uh, important level of violence against you." And what happened in Syria? I think it was. To show the example, look, this is this is what would happen to any population who is going to revolt against us. And now, when you see what happened in Algeria, we see that the, the Algerian or Moroccan or uh, everywhere they were so afraid of the, the fact that if we revolt, then we could go to have the uh, situation like in Syria or in. this has been. Um, yeah, the people in the Arab world are afraid. They are, they are tempted, you know, to revolt because they cannot, uh, cannot live under the dictatorship, and other, they are afraid of the price that has been paid by the Yemeni and the, the Syrian. I don't. I think uh, the choice is extremely difficult and extremely painful. But uh, at the, the end, they will revolt because nobody would be able, you know, to live under this corrupt and failed state. Corrupt and failed state, and before getting to another question, let me ask you briefly, you mentioned Syria many times, and of course we all know about the influx of jihadists, foreign jihadists into Syria. Apparently, according to many reports, uh, the biggest contingent of jihadists were Tunisian. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that, and how do you actually answer some of the ex accusations that were uh, directed to you? in that you facilitated, along with some regional powers, that influx into No, no, Syria. we didn't facilitate the departure of uh, Tunisian jihad. Of course, uh, I can assure you that uh, uh, it's the, uh, exactly the contrary would, have, would happen. But uh, let me explain to you how Tunisia... I am very often asked, uh, how come that Tunisia, which is a supposed peaceful society, etc., and the human rights activist, uh, uh, where the uh, human activist movement is extremely important, how, how come that uh, you have this, uh, this uh, kind of, uh, you know, the terrorist, mother, bloodist, and uh, uh, numerous? In fact, the Tunisian society is a complex society, like uh, every society. Uh, facing the dictatorship during the 90s, there were two, two kinds of response. I would say that the bourgeoisie, uh, Western bourgeoisie and uh, middle class, etc., reacted against to the dictatorship by saying we are going to uh, fight for our uh, dignity using human rights uh, association, using peaceful process, etc., etc. But we have also a tiny uh, portion of the population, the poorest population, the, uh, the, the young people li living in the uh, uh, poorest area of the country, would say, no, no, we cannot topple this dictatorship by this means of the bourgeoisie. We have to, to, revert, to go to the violence. So the response of the society was uh, uh, extremely different. One part, 
we will fight peacefully, and well, but we will fight with u using violence. And when the dictatorship was toppled, uh, part of this uh, young people who were against uh, uh, Ben Ali who were, we use a terrorism and violence under Ben Ali. Don't forget that. We use it to have terrorism attacks under Ben Ali, not, not only after. They said, no, no, this is not our revolution. It's the revolution of the bourgeoisie. We don't accept, etc. We are going to fight. They fight us. We have a lot of terrorist attacks in Tunisia. Don't forget that. We pro I probably lose the power because of the terrorist attacks. And many people would say, United Emirates are behind. Maybe, maybe not. It's our local problem, local problem. But many of these young people said, okay, we cannot do a revolution now in Tunisia, we will leave and we will go to Syria. And to... But in fact, it was a tiny, very tiny part of the, uh, of the, of the society. We have had, let's say, a few hundreds uh, g going to Iraq and to Syria. But the people who, who, uh, who were responsible for the, the, the peaceful revolution were millions. But, but their so departure was facilitated, encouraged? Hmm? Was their departure facilitated or encouraged no, in any no, way? No, 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 it's not. At, at the beginning, you know, after the revolution, every, the, the, the border were, were open. At the time, we were not in, uh, in office, you know. At the time, during the four or three months when, when the, the, the dictatorship was, uh, was over, then at that time, many people, uh, about 30,000 Tunisian, uh, left the country. 99% of them went to Europe for job, and 1% of them went to the battlefields of the Middle East. Let's take a question there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tofiq, Yemeni American from Seattle. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you, uh, President Marzouki, and uh, we really appreciate you being honest and straightforward regarding the fact that uh, Western governments are not really interested in real democracy when it comes to our countries and our nations. They are only interested in democracy and those regions when, it, when the winner is a dictator, when a dictator comes in power as in, in charge. So don't you think we are wasting our time chasing uh, the support of those Western governments uh, and the United Nations when in fact uh, that you said, and, and it's a fact that we all know that they're not interested in, re in real democracy, and when democracy uh, brings someone uh, who's a fair-minded person and who wants to advance uh, his nation, his country, then they, they, you know, they find ways to topple him and bring the old regime or, uh, or other, uh, other people who will, uh, uh, who will not be in, uh, in support of real democracy. Okay, so thank you. I think we'll leave it there because we've got other questions to get shouldn't to. Shouldn't we spend more time inventing or coming up with our own solutions, even if we have to go and engage our own enemies within our societies, our own tormentors, uh, because we're not going to get the help or the support from those governments, and that's a fact. Thank right. you. So any alternatives to Western support? The, the perennial double standards are... Yes, uh, I have always to deal, you know, in, uh, in Tunisia, uh, people, you know, uh, having a, an anti-Western uh, discourse, very violent, uh, like, the, you know, they, are, they hate us, they despise us, they, we have to rely on ourselves, etc. Et and I always repeat to them, say, look, uh, uh, forget about uh, the West as a whole. West is uh, values, civil societies, and government. So you have to consider that we have a lot of to learn from their values because I think uh, we always uh, have to learn from other nations, other people, etc. For the second level, don't forget that in fact. We, uh, we can rely, and we have always relied on the civil, uh, Western civil society. I can assure you that if I am just now before you uh, talking and if I am, am alive, I owe it to the uh, human rights organization in the 90s like, uh, uh, like Amnesty International, like uh, uh, Human Rights Watch, etc., etc. I can assure you that at that time, we have had a lot of support from the, uh, the uh, international uh, Western uh, uh, civil society organization. And then you have the government. And the government, quite sure that they, they are uh, dealing only with their interests. And uh, I have been, for the beginning, I waste a lot of my time in France, for instance, uh, trying to, to convince the French government. At, uh, but I saw the way that I was extremely shocked by the way that the French government in, uh, in 2030 accepted the coup in Egypt. 
I had a lot of uh, words with uh, Francois Hollande, who was at the time president of France. I can say that, I would say he's a friend of mine, but I know him very well, and we discussed, and I said, look, how, how come that you, socialist Democrats, etc., etc., you can't support this guy? I say, no, no, you know, uh, you know, etc., you know. No, I don't know. What's happened? What's, what's the problem? No, you know, uh, you know. Well, this is this is the situation. This is the reality. So we have to force them. Not we don't we, we don't have to reject uh, the, the values of human rights uh, because or democracy because supposedly they Western values. They are no more Western values. They are now international values. This is the most important thing. Then we have to rely on our. Uh, I I do believe that we can really rely on uh, civil rights, uh, human rights organization in the West. And forget about the government. Forget about the government. Forget about the government. President Marzouk. We're out of time. If there's anything else you want to say just before we close, I wanted to get to a couple of questions, but unfortunately we can't. Final thoughts, uh, President Marzouki, as we close this conference. Thank you so much. I hope I, uh, I, have not be, I haven't been too pessimistic. But once again, I do believe that we will win, that we will overcome. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all very much.